the session is now open. Um, I think we, we begin. My name is David Sigano from uh, the East Africa Law Society. I would like to welcome you all to this first uh, session of a three-part series of an ELS and uh, Nairobi branch training on digital forensics. Uh, this particular session, we are going to look at uh, admissibility of evidence. Uh, we have an expert with a lot of knowledge and experience in this particular area. Uh, and this has come as a result of a training we had where we had a lot of expression of interest uh, from participants who wanted more training in this area. So today we are going to look at four key areas. Uh, admissibility of uh, digital evidence, authority of the evidence, relevance of the evidence, credibility of the evidence, and integrity. So without having to say much, I welcome our Deputy Secretary General, who is also the Young Lawyers Representative, uh, to do the official opening uh, alongside uh, President, uh, Law Society of Kenya Nairobi Branch, Mr. Eric Theory. Uh, so Madam DSD, welcome. You will welcome uh, the president of the branch. We will uh, then welcome the official speaker, who is uh, Mr. Lawrence Dinger. Thank you. Good afternoon, members from all around the region. I'm delighted to host you, as always. Thank, I thank all of you for taking time to register and participate in this training. I'm sure uh, most of you had a lot to do, but you've taken the time to put aside some time to participate, and we are very grateful as ELS. Uh, allow me to introduce myself once again. My name is Barbara Maloa. I sit in as your Deputy Secretary General at the East Africa Law Society, and also the Young Lawyers Representative. I receive greetings from our President, Mr. Willie Rubert, and my fellow council members. Uh, this, they are always very delighted. I mean, I think right now we have, have about 112, 112 participants. It's always such a delight to know that uh, we have our members joining in from across the region. Uh, at this point, I'd like to first of all thank Nairobi Branch. We've partnered with Nairobi Branch to bring you this, Nairobi Branch in Kenya, to bring you this training. Uh, they've been able to circulate it within the members of um, the Kenya uh, Law Society of Kenya, and I can see a number of them are in attendance. Thank you very much, uh, our able chairman, Mr. Eric Theory. I've had David already starting to refer to you as president. Uh, he's, he has good wishes for you. <laughs> Abra, don't don't downgrade me. <laughs> Without further ado, Eric, I'll hand it over to you to welcome the Nairobi members, and also to welcome Mr. Lawrence Dinger, our speaker for the day. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Barbara. Uh, Deputy Secretary General of uh, East Africa Law Society, David. Uh, good uh, afternoon, uh, members. Uh, we are delighted to have you in attendance in this uh, very, very exciting uh, webinar uh, that is brought to you in partnership with the East African Law Society. Uh, we want to, at the very onset, uh, thank the East African Law Society for agreeing to work with us on uh, this very, very exciting area. Uh, we are living in uh, the digital era, and I think most of the things that we uh, interact with have uh, uh, have a digital footprint in one way or the other. So this is the kind of training that not only just gives you knowledge that uh, is useful when uh, you are litigating, but is also knowledge that is just useful as you carry around and do your activities on a day-to-day -day basis because more and more we get to interact with uh, uh, electronic and uh, computer uh, in our day-to-day -day, uh, interaction. So we are actually excited that uh, we have this uh, 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 training. 
of course, the menu is uh, also quite rich and uh, we have a speaker with us, uh, Mr. Lawrence Dinka, who has a lot of expertise and experience in uh, issues related to uh, cybersecurity and uh, digital forensics. So we are looking forward to this. Uh, just a few house rules. I think uh, we will take the presentation that will be given to us by our presenter and any questions uh, on any part of his presentation can just be posted on the chat. The moderators would uh, pick it up so that at the end of his presentation, we would be able to then pose those questions to, uh, to the speaker. And, uh, and then we have a, a, a question and an, an answer session. We, we project to do this for uh, probably the next two hours. So probably for one and a half hours, we will get the presentation. And then 30 minutes would be for uh, the Q&A uh, uh, section. So your, your questions should be put on the, on the chat and then they will be dealt with once the presentation is over. Uh, without further ado, and in the, east, in the interest of uh, saving on time, allow me, ladies and gentlemen, to welcome uh, Lawrence to give us uh, his uh, presentation. I did not want to go through his CV because it is extremely long. It would have taken me by when I was trying to prepare for it, I realized it would take me about not less than five minutes to go through it. And I would still not have done justice to it. So I'm just hoping that you will be able to do justice to it uh, during the course of his presentation. Lawrence, uh, Karibu Sana, we're really looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you very much, uh, Eric, for that introduction. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, three-part uh, webinar series on digital forensics and uh, uh, for legal professionals. Uh, I'll ju I'm just going to share my screen so that we start from there. I hope you can see my screen. Can you guys see my screen? Yes, it's visible. Yes, Lawrence is visible. Can't all right, see. all right. Uh, thank yeah. you very much. Uh, okay, as uh, as um, uh, Eric has uh, just introduced me, uh, uh, I'm a digital forensics expert, uh, witness in court, and I work closely with uh, lawyers in cases involving uh, cybersecurity and digital forensics. So our service revolve around investigation. Uh, of cybercrime cases and uh, for, forensic, by forensically acquiring that and analyzing that evidence and even reporting on that evidence. And if need be, I'll be able to uh, present my testimony in the court of law. Uh, sometimes you, you happen to be uh, a defense lawyer and the other party, the opposing party has just given you a report that uh, you need to analyze. We can also help you uh, to analyze that report so that, uh, <clears throat> so that we can tilt it to your, to your favor uh, by looking at uh, some of the, uh, we can poke holes on the report, look at some of the things that uh, uh, the, the, the other attorney or the other investigator did not do, and then taking advantage of that uh, to tilt the report to, uh, to your favor so we can also help you in that. Now, <clears throat> mm, let me just... Uh, Just a moment. Uh, let me just do for that. Uh, I just want to make my screen bigger. I'm not seeing the knee here. Uh, I don't know for what reason I can't see so I can put my screen to be bigger. Mm -hmm. 
sorry, I don't know. Uh, I'll just continue I'm, uh, as I'm searching for how to uh, put my screen to be a uh, full screen. I'm not seeing it here. Okay. Basically, I'm, I'm an IT uh, consultant uh, with the bias in cybersecurity. And I've been in IT uh, industry for the last 20 years, uh, having started with the, uh, with the networks uh, during those times when the, the computer just started, uh, MS-DOS and Windows and networks. Uh, so I have almost 20 years, uh, over 20 years experience as an IT. And um, being an IT guy, I thought that, yes, I've done a lot of IT. So what I'm going to do is to actually see if I can look at the, uh, the opposite side of IT because uh, as uh, IT has developed, you see that a lot of people also use IT for other nefarious uh, 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 motives. And so I decided to look at if this had something happens like that, how do you uh, investigate? So that's how I went into forensics. So I'm also a trainer. Uh, a presenter in cybersecurity and digital forensics uh, at the international level. Now, currently, I serve as a consultant to the Cybercrime Program uh, Office of the Council of Europe, and uh, they consult me when they need training, uh, judicial training in electronic evidence and, uh, and, and uh, uh, cybercrime and electronic evidence, and also law, law enforcement. If they need that training, then I can, they contact me and I can do that training. Now, as, uh, as uh, Eric has said, I'm um, a cybersecurity and digital forensics uh, expert uh, witness in court. So I normally be uh, called to uh, do some investigation maybe and then present my report in the court of law. Now, those are my qualifications uh, currently. Uh, I, am, I have MS in forensic computing from the University of Derby in England. I'm also a professional cybersecurity person. Uh, I, have, I have a certification called Certified Information Security uh, System Security Professional. Uh, because of this work that I've been doing, uh, I've, I've, uh, uh, it has been, uh, uh, I've looked at what I've been doing in the past, and then it gave me uh, some insight into getting into law, because I find myself when you get into into law, you need to get into court and there are some questions that you need to understand. You just need some basic understanding of law. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I I'm, I'm just, have, a, I just uh, have a diploma in law from the Kenya School of Law. And specifically, I have uh, LLM um, in, uh, in law, in ICT law from Open University of Tanzania. So that is, that is my, 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 my bio in short. Uh, I'm just trying to try to shorten it. Uh, leaving some as aspect, but I know this is what uh, we ne I need to to show you. Now, uh, let me just move this. Now, our agenda today: uh, first of all, we know that computers and networks have become ubiquitous in uh, in our society, and uh, they form part and parcel of our daily life. Uh, it happens nowadays that any uh, any legal dispute will uh, or investigation will always involve digital evidence. So it is important for lawyers because when you go to court, you need to understand this technology. You need to understand so that you, you are able to, to, to know which questions to, to, to put to either to direct examination or to cross examination. So it is important for a lawyer, any lawyer to understand this concept and principles of digital evidence. And that is what this session is all about today. It's going, I'm going to take around one and a half hours and uh, then we'll leave the, uh, the floor open for questions. Now, in this session, we are going to discuss the various types of digital evidence. What is digital evidence? What are the various types of digital evidence that you can actually extract and take to court? Then we are going to discuss the issues of admissibility in judicial pro proceedings in terms of, of the, its authenticity, its relevance to the case, its credibility, and its integrity. Because you know, digital evidence is different from the physical evidence, and it can it cannot be seen by uh, normal eyes. And you need a trained eye to to extract that evidence. Then we are going to look at um, identify challenges. Uh, uh, before that, we, we are going to look at the principles or best practices 
relating to seizure and handling of digital evidence. This is very important for a lawyer. And even if you are not an investigator and you have an investigator, you should know what are the principles and best practices that they should employ when they are seizing and handling digital evidence. Because if it is not properly handled and you bring it to court, it will be thrown out of the window. So it is important to know this principle. It's not important to know these best practices. Then we identify the challenges offered by dead, uh, dead box. Uh, when I say dead box, I mean, uh, uh, you go somewhere and you find a com computer is the, is the device that is, uh, uh, that is the suspect. And now you need to uh, collect evidence from there. You know, computer stay, uh, stores information on a hard disk. Now, where, uh, the, the information that is on a hard disk is permanent information. You can actually uh, have methodical uh, ways of extracting that, that data. So when you are extracting data that is on a computer, uh, then that is what we call dead box forensics. Uh, sometimes you go to a place and it is not possible to carry uh, that particular evidence, a piece of evidence. Though then what you need to do, you are told that you need to, uh, to collect data when the, the, the computer is running. Uh, for instance, you go to and you say, you find that the, uh, uh, there was an email uh, which was uh, a fraudulent email and it is existing on the server and the server is being used by this, this organization for other means. So it is not possible for you to, to take the server to take it for, to, to, to the laboratory for, for uh, examination. So what you do, you need to collect data when the server is running. And that is what we call live data forensics. Then we also have internet sources, where how do you collect uh, data from uh, internet? I mean, this, has, this uh, has got its own challenges because we find that uh, uh, comp the, the digital forensic is a young discipline. Uh, sometimes back when we were, we were uh, getting into uh, uh, this for forensics world, we were told that when you go uh, somewhere and you find a computer is on, then you just plug, the, uh, plug off the, 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 the power and uh, uh, you, you, you carry that computer. But you find that one, uh, during those times, the, the computer memory was very small. I can remember when uh, in, the, in the early 90s, early 80s, the, the, the 8086 uh, kind of IBM computers, they had only 640 memory. So when computer uh, beeps, you'll see that the computer uh, uh, um, uh, 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 connects and, uh, and counts up to 640, then the computer boots. Though in that case, you see, the, memo, the amount of data that can be memo, memory is only six, uh, uh, 640. But now, in a, a case where you have a, an a, a 8 GB, then you need to have another method of collecting that data. And internet also gives another dimension because uh, with the internet, you don't even know where the servers uh, are, are kept. Uh, I, I was attending one of the uh, uh, institution and uh, they were doing investigation. And when they went to uh, a client, they found that these guys had got the CPUs, these guys had got uh, uh, the, the monitors, and then they said that we are going to carry these, these, these devices. But these guys told them, our data is not actually existing on these machines. Our data is existing somewhere in the, on the cloud. So you can just see how internet has actually um, uh, 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 done uh, some, some, some challenges, proved some challenges too to digital forensics. So we're also going to go identify the challenges of obtaining, uh, of obtaining uh, evidence from another jurisdiction. Because here you find that, yes, uh, Kenya, uh, you have a case in Kenya, but what about if the case is between you and somebody in Uganda? Uh, how will you actually get uh, evidence from Uganda? Uh, what are the procedures that you need to follow? So that is our agenda today. Uh, um, and uh, I hope that we are going to, to uh, enjoy the session. Now, when we talk about uh, digital evidence, I can say, tell you that there is, no, uh, there is no internationally accepted definition of digital evidence. Uh, because in each and every country, there are regulations containing precepts which in some way refer to digital evidence. So, I, uh, but standard, way if you look at the dictionary it, you'll see that the, the digital evidence is any information generated uh, stored 
uh, transmitted in digital form that may later be needed to prove or disprove a fact disputed in legal uh, proceedings. So where do we get this evidence? This evidence, we get it from digital devices such as computers. We get it from uh, peripheral de devices such as printer. Uh, people sometimes think that the printer does not have information. Printers nowadays, which are uh, IP-based printers, have got actually hard disks which can uh, uh, store information that is being printed. So, and that is, this is why in cybersecurity, we find that for many people, for, for, for organizations to be hit, normally they use printers uh, because this is not where uh, no, no, a lot of security lab looks um, is. So we look at computer networks, we look at mobile phone. Those are all sources of digital uh, evidence. We look at uh, digital cameras and we look at storage devices as well as from the internet. So when you look at this, what kind of evidence you get? You get evidence such as the graphic files. You can get uh, audio and video. Like uh, last time, uh, I had a case where I was going to coach to authenticate video or uh, evidence that was brought to, to court. So how do you, uh, we are going to look at that. So those are some of the evidence. You look at the server logs, you look at the word processing and spreadsheet um, files. So these are some of the, the evidence that you can get. If you browse on the, on the, on, on, on the internet, you will get the internet browser history to see what this guy was doing on the, on the internet. Yeah. So that is that. So what is the role of digital evidence in a, in a case? Now, it is important to, for the, the, the uh, investigator or the lawyer to know that the role of digital evidence is to establish a, a credible link between the attacker, the victim, and the, 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 the crime scene. Because if you cannot prove that, then automatically that, invoid, that digital uh, uh, evidence will not be accepted in the court of law. So you need to prove to the court uh, beyond reasonable doubt that yes, the, this, this digital, this evidence that I'm providing is able to link attacker, the victim, and the crime scene. Now, this is illustrated by what we call Lockhart Exchange Principle. Now, the Lockhart Exchange Principle states that anyone or anything entering a crime scene takes something of a crime with them and leave something of themselves behind the, uh, when they leave. Now, this principle, <coughs> Oh, 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 this concept was developed by uh, Dr. Uh, Edmund Lockhart, who lived between 1877 and 1966. And what Dr. Lockhart uh, uh, speculated is that every time you make a contact with another person or place or anything, it results in an exchange of physical materials. Now, he believed that uh, no matter where a criminal, a criminal goes, or what a criminal, a, criminal, a criminal does, by coming into contact with things, a criminal can leave all sorts of evidence, including DNA, including fingerprints, including uh, um, uh, footprints, blood, uh, bodily fluids, all that. And at the same time, they will take something away from this crime scene. So this is uh, actually what uh, we've been it's been used uh, for a long time in the, in the in criminal investigation. However, also in computers, this this uh, principle applies because everything you do on a computer leaves traces. You when you uh, 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 access a website, you leave uh, a lot of things like uh, uh, website history. You when you uh, put anything on a, a USB on a computer, you leave entries on the registry, you leave deleted files. We have things like email headers or instant messaging that gives you clue as to the immediate servers through which the information has transversed. Server logs also have uh, provide information about computers um, um, uh, or system that they were accessing that particular server. So that is the role of a, 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 a digital evidence. And when you go to court as a lawyer, if you cannot prove that the evidence that is put before the court is, can be able to link properly, credibly link the attacker and the, the victim and the crime scene, I think you lose that case. And sometimes you find that also when you are maybe you are a, a, an opposed, uh, a defense attorney and somebody has the, the, uh, uh, given a report and you can look at that report, look at how they did the investigation. If there's any way that the uh, their processes not linking the attacker uh, to the victim and the crime scene, 
then you can actually uh, refute that case. Now, the problem with the digital evidence uh, challenges. You see, this dig the digital evidence is uh, is volatile. What is volatile, which means that it uh, sometimes when you put on computer uh, and the computer boots and, and, and it puts everything and the computer is now ready to be used, there's a lot of information that is that is stored in the random access memory. That is the, the RAM. Now, uh, uh, this information can usually be re overwritten just by usual functioning of the devices. Because sometimes you find that you have a computer which has got low, low in memory and the, the, the operating system will not keep everything in the, in the memory. So they'll have to transfer some data to the hard disk and then call that data uh, when they need it. So, so uh, volatility is, is an aspect that makes uh, the, the evidence, the digital evidence very, very much uh, uh, volatile. Now, the other, the, the other time, the other thing is that sometimes you go and, 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 and uh, find a computer and you shut it down. No, no, when you shut that computer down, everything that was in the memory of that computer will be gone. Now, that is the volatility. Sometimes you, you might, might pass through a, a place which has got magnetic or uh, through environmental factors such as excessive uh, magnetic uh, uh, mag heat or magnetic uh, uh, fields. Then the data can be wiped, especially for the, de the, uh, the, the hard disk that we have right now, which are uh, which are the, which are the uh, which are spinning hard disks. Now, the the other aspect challenge <coughs> is, is that the, it is fragile. Digital uh, evidence is uh, susceptible to alteration and can easily be manipulated, altered, and and damaged. Now, we we can say that they they relate between volatility and fragility. But when we talk about fragility, here we are talking even of, of the data that is. Uh, permanent in the in the hard disk. Now that is why it is important to have a process of collecting uh, digital evidence which is methodical and systematic. Now, because for example, if you have a hard disk and you're told that this is the, the where, where the, the evidence is, and then you start uh, uh, copying and pasting, you need you are changing a lot of data on that hard disk. So you, you how do you collect that? You need to find a way which is uh, uh, methodical and systematic. And this is just what uh, the, the graphic that I put there. This is uh, somebody trying to acquire data from the hard disk. And now you can see between the hard disk and the computer, which is uh, receiving that data, there's what we call the right blocker. Now the right blocker is helping, uh, preventing any information leakage from the computer back to the hard disk. So that fragility must be, uh, 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 must be uh, attended to uh, properly if you want don't don't want to uh, mess up with the data now the other thing the other challenge is decentralized storage uh, the availability of cloud remo uh, uh, remote storage servers has influenced the way in which information is stored I, I, i've shared with this you, you this one in the previous slide because one thing is that you find in many cases nowadays with the cloud computing it is becoming cheaper uh, it's bringing the computing cheaper and in fact it is it is getting back computing to those days of the mainframe where we had the dumb terminals and uh, we had the, the, the mainframe which was processing everything. That is the same thing that is happening with, happening with, the, with, the, with, the, with the decentralized storage, with the internet, with the cloud. Because what you have, what you need, you need just a device, you need the internet connection and your data is existing somewhere. So if there is an investigation to be done, how do the investigators get this data? Uh, no, th that brings uh, the, a lot of jurisdiction uh, uh, aspects. Now, there's also uh, the speed uh, of technical development. Technical development is continuing uh, at a first place and, uh, and a significant uh, number of development pose new challenges with regard to forensics. Now, I'll just give you an example. I'm not going to, 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 to expound on this. This is what we call, uh, we have the, the normal traditional hard disks, which are magnetic hard disks. Now, nowadays you find that we have what we call SSD hard disks. Now, SSD hard disk is taking uh, the technology by, by another, another, another wave. 
the wave of technology and you find that even right now when it comes to standards it's the, the standards uh, are, have not yet been developed but it has also a, 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 pro, a bigger impact on uh, forensic investigation so speed of uh, technical development uh, is, is a factor when you are looking at uh, uh, digital evidence now let's look at admissibility of evidence before any evidence you bring to court, before it is admissible, uh, uh, it must re, uh, ma ma maintain some characteristics. So digital evidence must be collected in compliance with the existing national legislation and best practices to ensure admissibility in the, in the court of law. Now, where I say national uh, um, uh, legislation is because digital forensics in most cases is being controlled by national legislation because each and every country have got a way of uh, defining digital evidence. If you go to, uh, to the, the UK, US, we have the, the, the federal, uh, federal rules of evidence. If we come to Kenya, we can look at uh, evidence from the, the Evidence Act Cap 80 uh, 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 for Kenya. So uh, when you are collecting evidence, you have to comply with the existing national legislation. Now, one thing that is very important before you collect anything is you must have the legal authority to, um, to, 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 to collect that evidence. The investigator must ensure that they have the legal authority to acquire and collect the, the evidence. Without that, that evidence, when you bring it to court, will, uh, will actually be thrown out of the window. I'm not into politics, but I've just one comment on something which happened in 2017, uh, run up in, in the general election of 2017. Now, when there was the, the, the results were disputed, uh, the right honorable Raila Omolo Dinga uh, came with an expert on uh, live TV, and then they claimed that the, the elections have, have been in, uh, stolen and they have uh, evidence to that effect. They can produce that evidence. Yes, I, whether they were true, they were wrong. But what, what happens at that particular time, if they could have gone to court of law, with that evidence, it could have been thrown out of the window because did they have the legal authority to, uh, to, uh, to uh, collect that evidence? So that is very important in, in, uh, in, in uh, digital evidence. You, miss, you must have the legal authority to, to, to access uh, that uh, evidence. Now, there's also the, the, the issue of authenticity. We say that authenticity is, is that the evidence uh, 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 shown is what it uh, is what it uh, purports to be. Mm. So if the evidence that is brought to court is what it purports to be, then we can say that the evidence is authentic. That authentic means that it is genuine and it matches the claims about it. Now, this sometimes uh, um, uh, I had a case uh, around this. Uh, I've, uh, I've had two cases around authenticity. One was authenticity about email uh, which was exchanged between two parties and uh, before they were ad admitted as, as evidence they had to be authenticated so they called me to authenticate that. The other one was also uh, authenticating video evidence uh, uh, which was the main thing uh, on, on, the, on, on, on the case. So it, the, what, uh, the, the, uh, where, how you could be able to make sure that the evidence that you present court is genuine and matches the claims that it be. That is the authenticity. Authentication of evidence is very important and no evidence will always be uh, admitted if there is um, uh, uh, the, the issue of authenticity is not, is not clear. The other thing is the relevance. Forensic uh, relevance is determined by whether the digital evidence say, establishes a credible link between the perpetrator uh, and the target and the crime scene. I think we will look at that. Uh, then there's the issue of integrity. Integrity is that there must be proof that the digital evidence has not been altered either inadvertently or intentionally. Because you see, as we say, that the digital evidence is not something that you can see with your own eyes. It is something that, uh, that, that is hidden. Now, if, if uh, you can prove, can prove to the court that this evidence, as we took it, it has not been uh, uh, in any way interfered with, then that is the authenticity, that, that's the integrity of the evidence. Now, there's also the aspect of reliability. There must be nothing about the way in which the evidence was collected and subsequently handled 
that may cast doubt on its authenticity and veracity. Now, to ensure uh, this reliability, it is important, it is always important that when you are doing this image, then you need to put the audit trail. And this audit trail uh, log must grow to, it will grow to code so that the court will see if there's any, uh, uh, the, the, how the process was done with a clear records of success or failure in all, in, in, in all or, or, or parts of the coping process. So uh, that is when we know that, yes, this is the process they use. This is the log that we use. Now you can show that to the court, then the court will say, okay, it is a reliable evidence. The other thing is about credibility. The credibility is a measure of witness and whether or not the witness is worthy of belief. A witness become, must, uh, might be considered credible if they have reliable information about the, 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 an event. Now, that is where you as, a, as, as an investigator, come. <clears throat> your, 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 your uh, expertise comes. Now, in this case, in most cases, to establish this, this credibility, the investigator must have to testify in court about the qualification they possess, about the investigation standard that they employed, about the, the tools and procedures they use to collect the evidence, about the, the, uh, the method by which they preserve that even, uh, evidence, especially where it involves uh, um, uh, volatile evidence. How did they preserve that evidence for it to be brought to court? Now, the other thing is that the qualification of, of, of the uh, digital forensics uh, are important and they are examined to establish the, complete, the, the competency of the individual handling and analyzing evidence and whether the competency of this, uh, this expert and analyst were uh, verified and tested. Uh, tested. Because we ju you don't just bring anybody uh, 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 to, the, to the court that, and say that, yes, this evidence is, is, is uh, uh, credible. Now, the other, <clears throat> the other the last aspect is what we call the validity. The validity, <clears throat> is a way to demonstrate that digital evidence is reliable by showing that it was collected in a valid manner. Whether scientific principles were used to observe, to preserve, to acquire, and to analyze digital evidence and the standards that were met to handle and examine the digital evidence. Now, this one, uh, you, you, you need to, this, this sort of evaluation uh, seeks to determine whether scientific principles are used to preserve acquire and analyze digital evidence and the standards were met to handle the, 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 the uh, handle and examine the evidence. We also look at the, the standards and protocols of, of digital forensics laboratory that was used to examine this evidence and see whether they, the, uh, to determine its competency uh, of the laboratory in handling this kind of uh, evidence, uh, the analysis of evidence and the production of the uh, uh, reliable results. We also look at <coughs> uh, uh, what is particularly examined is whether the, 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 the laboratory that was used to analyze the evidence uh, you, was using the reliable method, appropriate and properly functioning uh, equipment and up-to-date software uh, or with competent personnel and drawing reasonable uh, results. So it is, it is very important that those issues must be in, uh, uh, observed when a digital evidence is, is brought to court. And this is very important for lawyers because if you don't know these things, then somebody will come with uh, an evidence. And if you don't look at the way it was collected and it does not uh, to, to show that some of this uh, admissibility uh, criteria are missing, then I think uh, you lose the case, but it is, not, it is not always good to lose a case just on this flimsy uh, uh, reason. So it is important to, to actually uh, have this kind of knowledge. Now, there's also what we call the principles of digital evidence. Now, this, these principles were <clears throat> uh, crafted by uh, what we call ACPO, ACPO principles. The ACPO, uh, ACPO is an association of police officers in the, in the UK, the Scotland Yard. Now, before in, uh, forensics was, was mature, this guy had actually uh, been doing because you remember the IBM computers uh, in, the, in the 80s, they realized that yes, these, are, these devices are, must be having some evidence. So they, they, they started the forensic laboratory in, in, in the Scotland Yard and they came up with some principles of digital evidence. And then these are four principles that must be observed by any person who is doing the investigation of digital evidence. Principle number one, 
No action taken by law enforcement agencies, uh, persons employed within those agencies, or their agents should change the data which may subsequently be relied upon in court. Now, this principle means that the acquisition and subsequent analysis of electronic data it has to be undertaken with all due regard uh, to preserving the data and to, in a state in which it was when it was first discovered. So that is, that is the principle number one. It, it also must make sure that the forensic processes should not be in any way diminish the evidentiary value of the uh, digital uh, data through technical, procedural, and interpretative, interpretative errors. Because technical, you might have the process wrong, and if the process is wrong, or the, 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 the computer is wrong, or the, the computer is faulty, or the software is faulty, or procedural, you did not you, you properly follow the, the correct procedure. So that principle just make sure that when uh, uh, the, whatever you are doing does not actually diminish the evidentiary value of the electronic evidence. Uh, uh, I, I, when you bring it to court. Now, the other thing is that sometimes when you have to, uh, to, to, to get information from live computer system, this must be done in a manner that causes least impact on the, on the data uh, and the person must be qualified to do so. So that is what uh, the principle number one states. So it covers a lot of uh, things that, so when you are going to, to, to court, just make sure that uh, the, 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 the act for principle number one, what does it say? And then you'll be able to see what questions you can put across, uh, whether during uh, examination or cross-examination. Now, principle number two, in circumstances where a person finds it necessary to access original data, that person must be competent to do so and be able to give evidence explaining the relevance of implication of their action. Now, this is very straightforward. Now, this is very straightforward in the, in, because sometimes you go and you find cases whereby uh, the, the, uh, the, the data is not stored locally, but it is stored on a remote, in a remote place and it is not possible to get an image of that data. In this case, the, the person that, who is doing that should, can be able to re recover the data, access and recover the data, remo uh, 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 they, they can be able to recover that data uh, 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 through remote system uh, directly. I mean, uh, di directly. They can be able to recover that data directly. And when they do that, they need to be able to explain to the court what they did and how that has got an impact on, uh, on, uh, on, the, on, on, the, on that particular evidence. So uh, uh, the, the, the other aspect is uh, uh, principle number three, that is the audit, uh, uh, audit trail. Uh, it says that an audit trail or other record of, uh, of all processes applied to digital evidence should be created and preserved. An independent third party should be able to examine those processes and achieve the same result. And this, what, is, what does it say? Remember, what I did not mention is that when you have uh, the, the evidence, the best evidence rule says that the evidence must be the original. So it is not always uh, 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 advisable to tamper with the original evidence. And that is why you, in, 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 in when, what we are going to see in digital forensics uh, part of it, we are going to see how to cover, how to get a bit by bit copy of that original evidence so that the original evidence can be brought to court, um, uh, to, can be brought to court uh, as, as the original uh, uh, evidence. So it is important that, because when you do this, uh, well, let's say you interfere with the evidence and you come to court and the other the person says, party says that now uh, we've seen no air report, but we want that original evidence so that we can actually do our own investigation. Then what will you do? Because you do already uh, uh, interfered with the original evidence. That is the, the data, uh, the original data. Now, I found this last year was very interesting. Now, last year I was in Hu court and the prosecution uh, brought uh, the, uh, the, the, the evidence on a CD. Now, when they brought the evidence on a CD, and that was the only uh, evidence that was for that, 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 for, that, for that case. Now, there are two things. When, when, uh, when uh, uh, the, the lawyer who was handling ca that case gave me the report and I looked at the report, just that is why I'm say, telling you that 
sometimes you are given a report and uh, this guy is going to be uh, your client is going to be prosecuted on flimsy reasons uh, and you you just need an expert to look at that report and see what are the some of the the, 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 the loopholes in that report so what i found out in that that uh, that report is that these guys had collected the uh, had, had collected evidence through a video uh, device however when we looked at uh, when i looked at the report there was no mention of what or the, the type of video device it was the date of the manufacturer uh, manufacture the manufacturer of the dd view it, it it was just showing on the report that it is a mobile like uh, uh, device so i refuted that i said this is a mobile like how do we know that um, that uh, it was working properly secondly when they brought the, the evidence to the, co the, the, the this court, it's, it's, a, it's supposed to, 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 to be in the court until the case is over. Then I found out that they took it uh, back and the court agreed that they take back the evidence because they, they say that there was some other evidence in that particular device. So you find that in this case, uh, uh, in fact, my clan won because in this case, the thing is that how do you know uh, that, that, that this evidence, uh, uh, if we say that yes bring us that, that device so that we can do our own investigation will you be able to, to do that so it is important that uh, an audit trail and other records process must be applied to digital so that it is preserved so that the other party can use the same same process that used to arrive at the same answer or the same results now principle number four is just the person in charge of the investigation has to the overall uh, responsibility to ensure that uh, the law and uh, and this principle are adhered to. Now let's have a look at some of the some 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 of the types of digital data. We've talked about volatile data. This is data that is easily modified and can be lost when a device is shut down. It is contained in the RAM. Then we have non-volatile data. Sometimes we call the persistent data or permanent data. That is data that is stored on the on the hard disk. Now when you fire up. Uh, and a Microsoft Word application, and you create a document, and you save that document. You save that document in in, in, uh, in the hard disk, and that document will not be uh, erased when the, 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 you shut down the computer. The computer. Then there is what we call the transient data. The transient data is data that is created when application uh, and uh, uh, within application session. For example, you are logging onto the internet. Uh, or log, logging onto the server, that information is stored on the on lo locally on that machine. And when you shut down the machine, that the information is not there. So those are transient data, uh, which include a network uh, uh, connection, include uh, user logout. Then we have what we call residual data. Uh, that is data that is stored in a computer when a document is deleted. Now, I need to be very clear here. When a document is deleted in a computer, it is never deleted. So don't be cheated that I've deleted a, com a document in a computer and I'll not be able to retrieve it. That document will be retrieved by people like us. Now what happens, uh, how the uh, computer store documents is like uh, when you go to, to uh, you have a book and uh, before you go to any preface, whatever, you have what we call the table of contents. Now the table of contents, the same principle of table of contents whereby you want this information and you can see that it is in page so and so, then you go direct to that page and get that information. That's the same way operating system stores uh, uh, information in the, in the, uh, on the computer. So what happens is that operating system has got what we call file allocation table. Now file allocation table is like the table of contents. So what happens when you delete a file, uh, that file is not physically deleted on the, on the hard disk. What happens is that the operating system marks that place where that file was existing as a free space, but the file is not deleted. So what happens is that uh, it will just uh, say, okay, this file is, delete, uh, is deleted. So when a new file comes, operating system knows that, yes, I've flagged uh, that particular space as, uh, as, as, the, as the deleted, so I can overwrite there. So you find that when you bring a new file, it is written on the place that, that was marked uh, deleted. But you, you, now this depends now what is the size of the, the file? See, if I have a document of 80 pages, which I saved on the, on, the, on, the, on the hard disk, now I've deleted it. Now the operating system marks it as deleted, and maybe this, this had got a lot of information. This is the, 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 crimi uh, the, the, the criminalizing uh, information. So what happens that when you, you delete it, 
and then uh, later on you come up with a, 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 a document which is only 20 pages. You see, the, 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 B, uh, the 80 pages is much bigger than the, the 20 pages. So the, the allocation, the, 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 the allocated space for the, 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 20, the 80 pages is big. So when you come and overwrite this space of 20 uh, uh, with the 20, uh, 20 page document, you find that the whole space is not deleted. There's going to be some, some remnants of the original file that was 80 pages, which is remaining. And that is what we call residual data. That data is very important for investigators because this is where you, you find a lot of information that you are looking for or, or when you're doing the investigation. Then we have what we call metadata. Metadata is, uh, is record about a particular document, uh, which includes the, the format and how and when and who created the document, saved and modified it. Now, if you have your, your Word document, you come and you, 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 you create a Word document and save it. Now, when you save that, that information, there's some information that is not going to be visible when you open that document, that is what we did, data, uh, what we call metadata. Now that metadata has got the date when the file was created. It has got the, the, how the file was created, the application that was used to create the file, and when and who created that file. That is what we, and that metadata is very important in your investigation. I can remember uh, I, I was doing uh, one, one investigation uh, this year, and uh, I actually relied very much on the metadata. Uh, now, Let's look at the, the, the authentication of digital evidence. Now, digital evidence, as I said, before it is, can be ad admitted as an evidence, it has to be authenticated. Now, let's look at two, uh, three scenarios here. When you are using computer, you are generating content. So you can generate a content by one or more person, like you, you are doing a text email, uh, you are doing a text, you are doing a email, you are doing instant messages, uh, uh, and, and such like. So that is content generated by a person. Now, there's also, when you are using, the computer is fired on, there's also content that is generated by the computer itself or the digital di device itself without the user input. These are things like the data logs. So those, those are, those, oh, the, that is also content within um, uh, the, the digital evidence. Then there is content generated by a combination of both. That is, maybe you can have a, a spreadsheet with pro, uh, from programs like such, a, like, such as Excel, uh, which include user input and calculation that made by software. So what happens is that for authentication to take place in the court of law, any device generated content can only be admitted if it, is, it can be shown that, the, uh, the, 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 that it was properly functioning at the time the data was produced. And if it can be shown that the data was generated and security mechanism was, uh, uh, were present to prevent alteration of data. So that is the data that is generated. So it is important, and we are going to look at the, the Evidence Act. Uh, it comes out very clear. Uh, how, do you uh, how do you generate, uh, make sure that you authenticate uh, uh, device-generated content? Now, the user-generated content can only be admitted if it is trustworthy and reliable, or, uh, and it can be attributed to that person. So I'll give you an example. This is an email communication. This is a case that I had sometimes back in 2016. Now, this is, uh, they had a, a, a several emails that was uh, between uh, one party and the other. So the thing was, I was called in court to authenticate this email to see whether they can be admitted as evidence. And you know very well that email is something that can be spoofed. Somebody, uh, the, the protocol that is being used to, to send email across the network, uh, the, the internet is a very weak, uh, insecure uh, protocol. That is SMTP. I can actually generate a mail and say that it's coming to you while it is not actually coming to you. So email can actually be, be spoofed. Now, for this email to, to be uh, uh, admitted as evidence in the court of law, I had to go and uh, uh, authenticate this email. Where did they come from this person? Did they go to this person? So. Uh, that is this the, the, this one. Uh, ask, uh, that's one of the emails that I've just created. Now, the other, when you look at when I I I, I, could, I was authenticating this email, I was dissecting what we call email header because within email header, I'll be able to find a lot of rich information that will tell me that this email is either spoofed or this email is not spoofed. This is email is real. So when I do, did my investigation, you can see I, I I can see on on number one there I can say that yes. Uh, I, I could sh show that this email came from this person. 
Now, number two there, you can see that I could show that this email had got a particular signature, a particular watermark that was on this email. And this is what we call DKIM uh, signature, which uh, on the Yahoo, this was a Yahoo mail, a Yahoo uh, signature is, um, I, I highlighted that in, in green. Then you can see that on, on the, the number three, I have some string of text there. I could say this, this string of text could, uh, I could use this string and go to Yahoo and tell them, please pre uh, print for me this email. And it will be printed because it actually passed through their server. Uh, the other thing is uh, when you look at the X mailer, uh, I, you can see number four, this email was actually uh, created using iPad. Uh, and that's the, the, the version of the iPad. So you can see from this, this email is going to be authenticated as a, a proper evidence because it has got uh, features that cannot refute that it did not come from this person. So that is how you do authentication of email. E e email. Uh, there are uh, various evidence. It could be video evidence, could be audio evidence. How do we authenticate that? Because before it is, is uh, accepted in court of law, it has to be authenticated. And I can still refer to my uh, case I have last year of uh, audio and video evidence. I tell you, uh, if uh, the, the, the kind of work that was done by the prosecution was quite, quite poor, it was very, very poor. So if we can, uh, if we can harm this knowledge, then we can be able to know how we, uh, uh, we authenticate emails. Now, there's the rules of evidence. Now, the rules of evidence differ within, the, within any, each and every jurisdiction. We have digital evidence can be collected in compliance with the national uh, legislation and details may be differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So that's why we, uh, we, we are not saying that we have, this is how we describe digital evidence in our case. Now, evidence has to be presented in court, must comply with the established rules of evidence. Now, when you go to the, uh, to the US, we have the, 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 the federal rules of evidence. When you come to Kenya, uh, we have the Evidence Act. So uh, there must, the rules of evidence uh, uh, states that evidence must be uh, preserved in court uh, and must be complied with the established uh, uh, rules of evidence. Rules of evidence govern whether, when, and how, and for what purpose uh, proof of, of a case must be placed before a trial of fact for consideration. Then the best evidence rule is established to prevent an alteration of digital evidence, uh, either intentionally or unintentionally. And the best digital uh, best evidence is the original piece of evidence or an accurate duplicate of the original. Now, this, this last point, we are going to look at it when we are looking at the, the, the second session of uh, digital forensic process. Uh, how do you make sure that you do not interfere with the original evidence? And how do you make sure that the, the, the evidence that you, you, you have, the copy of the, that copy of evidence represent a true copy of the original? So that is being looked at when it comes to, uh, to digital forensics process. Now, now let's uh, as I said, it, it depends on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the local legislation. We have Evidence Act, Section 78A. Now, in Section 78A, uh, the Act recognizes and endorses the use of electronic evidence, uh, reiterates the condition of or admissibility of uh, electronic evidence. In any legal proceedings, electronic messages and digital materials shall be admissible as evidence. That's according to the Act. I'm, I'm, these are, I've got this from the Act. Now, the court shall not deny admissibility of evidence under, uh, under only the ground that it is not an or its original form. Now, the, the weight attached to electronic evidence uh, is determined by the reliability of how it was generated. So we are going back to those principles. We are going back to those admissibilities and you can see that each and every jurisdiction, they have their own ways of validating evidence. So it, it must make sure that it was generated, uh, stored and communicated properly, uh, it reliably, it was uh, preserved reliably. The originator was identified. And now you can remember, remember just uh, the, the previous slide where I say that I can now, I can be, without any doubt, be able to link this person as the originator of this email uh, when I bring that email to court. So uh, the originators can be identified and any other relevant factor. 
Now, we also look at the section uh, 106B. That is the, the, uh, the condition in order to certify the court, uh, it meets the, the, this criteria. So the electronic record was produced, fed into, or derived from computer in the ordinary course of the business by a person having lawful control over the computer. That's very, that point is very important. The, the, the computer was operating, operating properly, or if there was any, in any way in which it was not properly, uh, operating properly, then such malfunction was not of such nature to, as to affect the electronic record or accuracy. Now, there must be a certificate signed by the person occupying the responsibility uh, or responsible po position in relation to the operation of that particular uh, device or, 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 or relevant activity. Now, this is something I found that no, not so many lawyers know about this. And when they, they bring cases to court, this is where they fail. And let's look at the, uh, what are the function of the, 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 the certificate. It is to identify the electronic evidence containing the uh, statement and describing the manner in which it was produced, uh, giving such particulars of any device involved in the production of the electronic record as may be appropriate for the purpose of showing that the electronic evidence was produced by, the, by a computer. Dealing with such matters as to uh, relate to uh, subsection two and purporting to be signed by a person occupying the responsible position in relation to operation of the relevant device uh, or the management of the device. So a certificate is something that people do not, uh, many lawyers do not know about this section 106B uh, 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 when it comes to digital evidence. Now let's look at this, this case law, Rasanga and Obdul, uh, 2014. Uh, the witness statement was back, backed by a CD uh, that was said to carry a video clip and uh, he said uh, he had captured using his Nokia phone. It contained footage and, uh, of the election clerk with marked ballot papers, preparing to stuff them into the ballot box. The clip had been transferred from the phone to a disk without a certificate. The witness, being the owner of the phone, uh, uh, said nothing uh, about the working condition of the, 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 the Nokia phone. No evidence regarding the computer used, uh, i.e. how did it or was it uh, transferred from the uh, mobile phone to the CD? What computer, what computer was used? What was the com condition or reliability of that computer? No evidence show to show that he was the one who owned the, and operating, operated the, that particular device. So the, uh, the condition of, of any device used in the process uh, of creating and, and a signature uh, from the person who was legal possession of the gadget should have been provided. Now, what did, what, what did uh, Justice Nchilule say? The person who had copied the clip from the phone to the computer had not created a, a, such a certificate to make it acceptable. Uh, the reason for particulars of the computers used in the production of CD ha had to be given and such particular would include things like Mac and serial numbers of the, the, of the computers, so that if it becomes necessary, one can trace the devices by, uh, for audit purposes. And the ruling was done in the favor of Rasanga. This is because this somebody thinks that you, you just go and, and take a video somewhere and then you bring it to court. You have to look at the section, uh, section uh, 106. And secondly, the other thing is you have to be able to convince the court how uh, make sure that you you the, the way you collected that uh, evidence the way to preserve what we call the chain of custody so that is uh, a local case there are other ways where um, uh, uh, internationally we, uh, they, they've come up with the uh, ways to 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 look at digital evidence. Now, International Organization of Computer Evidence was established in 1995 uh, with the purpose of providing a forum for global uh, law enforcement agency to exchange information regarding cybercrime investigation and other issues. Now, the problem is, this is a big problem. Uh, 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 cybercrime is a, 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 a worldwide problem. So what happens that sometimes you find that in Kenya, we do not have laws that are, 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 
are, are addressing uh, cyber crime maybe uh, so right now we have the, the computer crime uh, but what, what what constitutes of a, a crime a cyber crime in Kenya it may be not be the same thing that constitutes a crime uh, cyber crime in Uganda so these are guys who are trying to come up with uh, some standards uh, so they develop IOC developed international principle for the standardized recovery of computer-based evidence uh, governed by the following attributes. They wanted consistency with all legal systems. Remember, different legal systems and different jurisdictions have got their own way of validating digital evidence. So they also wanted allowance for use of uh, common language uh, and ability for international boundaries. You know, you see, uh, cybercrime is, 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 uh, is borderless. So I can do a, uh, do a crime here and the crime, uh, I'm a Kenyan, and the, uh, the, uh, the computer that I attacked was in, in, in Uganda, and, and the, the other people are, now which law uh, uh, are we going to, 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 to use to, to, to prosecute? So the uh, IOEC, uh, IOEC is, is one such body. Then the other, uh, what does IOC uh, talk about when we talk about computer evidence? It says that when dealing with digital evidence, all the general forensic and procedural principle must be applied. Uh, upon seizing digital evidence, action should not change that evidence. Remember our principle number one in, in, in uh, ACO. When it is necessary for a person to access the original data, <coughs> evidence, that person should be trained for the purpose. Remember principle number two. Uh, all activities relating to the, to the seizure, access, storage, uh, transfer of digital evidence, must be fully documented, uh, preserved, and uh, available for review. Uh, uh, then, oh, oh, individual responsible for the action, uh, for, the, for, for all the action, must be uh, with, res with respect to, to evidence, while least uh, evidence, uh, evidence is in their position. They must make sure that they have good custody of that evidence. Now, the other thing is the scientific uh, working group on digital evidence. Is, this is more of UK, US based, uh, but they have standards that can be applied. Now, one of them is the principle number one, which is in order for the, the digital uh, uh, evidence to be collected uh, and examined or transferred in a manner that suffers the accuracy of that evidence. Now, sources of evidence, we have various sources of evidence. I can, we can see this one. Uh, we have the hard disk, we have the storage devices, we have the the, the optical disks, we have the memory cards, we have the USB, nowadays the USB has, <coughs> uh, uh, has infiltrated a, a, any device. We have things like peripheral devices uh, that has, all these things have got evidence. We have mobile phone and tab tablets, so we have digital cameras and the video camera, all these have got uh, uh, digital evidence in them. So what can you, what are the potential evidence you can get? You can get things like documents, you can get things like uh, photos, uh, emails, attachments, uh, database, databases, financial information, a lot of information that you are going to, in, to get from this uh, uh, sources, depending on what you are investigating. Now, what happens, uh, or we talked about uh, handling of digital evidence. Now, how do you seize digital evidence? One thing that you need to, 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 uh, to understand here that the digital evidence can be it can be dead box. I explained the dead box whereby you can seize uh, equipment uh, and storage media, uh, or you can seize the, uh, by copying the entire memory uh, or imaging the, 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 or mirroring, or you can do seizure by confiscating the backup uh, storage media. But the dead box just means that this is information that is residing on that particular device and it is persistent, it is permanent. So what you need to do is just to, to make sure that you have that um, that hard disk you have to move the hard disk you have to, to uh, follow the standard and methodical procedures to make sure that you you get the data from that particular hard disk or whatever device it is then we also li have live forensics here here i told you that you can go to a place and uh, the thing is that you 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 cannot actually seize that doc uh, that server so what happens is that what what do you do you need to to uh, you, you need to make sure that you can get that data when the co the computer is running, uh, and there, there there are other aspects that you need to take into place. That is why it is important that the person who is doing that is 
uh, has, has got good training on how to do that. So live data forensics. So we have the data, data forensics. We have live data forensics, uh, whereby you seize the data while copying the while the server is running. So you get to a place and you see that the server has got uh, is 14 GB of memory or 15 GB of memory. How do you how do you get that data? First of all, you need to get the data which is in memory. Secondly, you need to get uh, the data which is in the hard disk because you have to have a methodical way of doing it. Because if you don't do that, then you are going to interfere with the data. For example, if you go to a place and you find a machine, a machine which is on, and then you turn turn it off. Now, the possibility of maybe encryption which was being used on that machine is possible, and which means that when you turn it off, when you are going to turn it off and there's encryption, that's the end of it. You are not going to get any any information. So you have to know <coughs> how do I access the data. You start with the order of volatility, the data which is in the memory, and then the data which is in the the, the hard disk. The data which is in the, the network so that is what we call live forensic you can also do the the seizure of data from the internet now this one involves things like putting the packet sniffers on the network the the, the, the the network and then capturing those packets and analyzing them because they have a lot of a wealth of information in in that in that area now how do you prepare for the seizure you you the, the procedures is that you prepare for the seizure you secure the scene, you document the scene, you collect the evidence, and then you package that uh, and transport that, that evidence to where it is supposed to be. So in the preparation, you access, uh, access, uh, assess the likelihood of and types of evidence that must be encountered. Now here, you know, because you, know, you want to know which, which devices am I going to deal with here. The device that you are going to deal with will uh, determine what kind of procedure that you are going to be using to do the forensics. If it is a mobile phone is in the scene, then you should not, you cannot use the same procedure of extracting data on mobile phone uh, with the same procedure of extracting data from a computer. There are totally different uh, methods of doing that. So it is important that during preparation, you make, make sure that what are the dev devices that are involved here. You look at the hardware, you look at the, uh, the, the application, you look at the storage, you look at the communication and networks, you look at a lot of things, including uh, how much data is, is to be copied. Uh, do you have the right devices to copy that data? How much equipment is present, uh, present and uh, how will it be seized? Uh, which are uh, identify which person, the person which are, who are in, uh, responsible so that they can help you. So it is important uh, to prepare uh, adequately because preparation will help you know we have the methods, uh, the, the procedure and the methods of you, uh, that you are going to use at the same time is they're going to tell you how, uh, which kind of devices or which kind of gadgets that you need or which kind of software that you need. Now you secure the scene, protect the uh, data that is perishable, uh, data uh, physically or electronically, identify and document related document, uh, electronic components now it is very important here that you just like the physical way of securing the, 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 the criminal scene the same way you can use on the the, the, the computer uh, forensic scene you just make sure that you 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 do the right thing and make sure that you can also do the pre preliminary interviews to make sure to of the people who are there documenting the scene documentation is very important if you are going to bring this thing to court because for you to 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 win a case, it will depend on how you convince the court on the process that you uh, followed. Now, without documentation, and documentation most of the time, like if you go to a scene, you need to, you, and you find a, a, a computer, one of your partner that you need should always have with you is the digital camera. You have to uh, for, make, uh, 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 take a photo of the environment, see each, which wire goes where before you do anything. So that is part of personal documentation. So documentation is very important when you are doing your, 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 your uh, collection evidence. So you need to look at the uh, physical scene, computer system and electronic uh, components. You need to look at the details of relevant uh, equipment that are found there, condition, all this you need to, to make sure that uh, they are, uh, uh, you capture them. Capturing this is very important. Uh, photograph the front of the computer as well as the monitor because you, you when you go back to the the, the, the lab, la, laboratory you need to know how these were connected so that you can connect them 
If any computer is on, please do not shut it off until uh, if you are not, uh, you are not uh, an expert, let the expert come and know what to do. Do not just shut down the computer that you find in a, in a scene because you might be losing a lot of data or a lot of digital evidence from that. Collecting an IT should be, not be seized as evidence just because it happens to be at the scene. So such measure must be justified and uh, in proportion with the corresponding uh, offense. Therefore, the person who ordered the search should make sure uh, a, con a conscious uh, decision whether an item is, is to be collected by investigating. Now here, remember collection, uh, when we say before you do anything, you have the legal authority to do that. Now, packaging must make sure that when you are packaging uh, this thing for uh, transport, observe things like the sensitive te temperature. Because the, uh, if you are using ma magnetic, uh, magnetic hard disk and you subject it to humidity or, or electronic, uh, uh, static electric, it, you might lose the data. Now, sometimes you find that I go to a place and get a, a mobile phone. A mobile phone, especially, let's say it is, it is, uh, it is uh, iPhone. Now, if that person knows that you've confiscated the phone and this phone has got incriminating uh, uh, evidence, then you know that very well that that person can actually delete all the information uh, remotely. So it is important that when you're transporting this information, you put it in a way that it cannot be, be, be tampered with. And in, for mobile phone, we have what we call uh, Faraday, Faraday bugs. Uh, I don't have it here, but I'll show you ne next time. Faraday back so that that in phone will not communicate with the, out the outside world. Secondly, you know, if it is on, leave it on. Don't turn it off because there could be password on that phone and there's nothing you can do, do about, it or, about it. This is what we call uh, um, uh, anti-forensics. Now, evidence management. This is very important because when you go to court, what we, uh, the evidence management will be looked into uh, very details. It refers to the administration and control of evidence related to an event so that it can be used, uh, 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 so, so, so that it can be used to prove the circumstances of uh, event and that this proof uh, can be tested by independent parties with confidence that the evidence collected is related to the event. So you must have a proper evidence management. Now this proper evidence management is what we call uh, the chain of custody. The chain of custody is that uh, 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 chronological documentation or paper trail. The, the custody, the control, the transfer, the analysis and disposition of physical evidence, which means that when you seize the evidence that you start chain of custody from that particular time until this evidence will be released uh, to, the, to, to the owner uh, after the case is done. Now, one of the faults, uh, for, uh, I told you last year I had a case, one of the fault, uh, uh, fault that I found out is that when these guys did uh, their video plus blah, 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 uh, using this mobile line, they again came and took it from the court and the court allowed them. And that alone uh, uh, did not, uh, the chain of custody was broken. And that, if the chain of custody was broken, I mean, that evidence cannot be authentic. Uh, secondly, when I looked at, uh, I didn't mention that, when I looked at the document, the, the, the document and, and the CD, because it was only a CD that was uh, the main uh, evidence there. So when I looked at the CD, the case was in 2018, and everything which happened was in 2018. However, when these people, when they took the CD, they did not change the date. The date was reading 2014. So that date stamp alone, I, I refuted that evidence. I just tell uh, this is not, this evidence does not relate to the case because the case is 2018, everything is done, done in 2018 and the evidence reads 2014. So you have to be very careful, very, very, very careful. When somebody, you are representing somebody, make sure that the investigation is done properly with a competent person so that uh, when you go to court, you don't embarrass yourself. To maintain the chain of custody, you must preserve the evidence from the time it is collected to the time it is presented to the court. To prove the chain of custody, they must, the, uh, the, the investor must satisfy that the evidence uh, offered in the court is the same evidence that was collected. Uh, the, that the evidence offered in court is the same evidence that was collect, received uh, to the time and uh, date the evidence was received and transferred to another agency. So those date sums are very important. 
that there was no tampering with the evidence while it was in custody. So a chain of custody should be initiated at the time evidence recovered. The, the chain of custody begins as soon as the seizure takes place and complete, concludes uh, when the evidence is returned or destroyed to the, uh, by the court. So this is just a, 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 a form of chain of custody. Uh, you can see that I have a lot of information that I put there, the case number, the offense, the submitting officer, the victim. So all these things you must make sure that when you are, you are in court, you, you are presented with these documents and you have to look at uh, meticulously class, uh, what kind of information that you need there. The what information that is going to make sure that your case is tilted uh, in your favor. So these pertinent things that we, we don't we, we ignore are actually the, the main base that forms our case. So that is a, a chain of custody. You can see that this guy collected two pieces of evidence, Dell and uh, emission DVR. And then what happens is that in the next, he makes sure that he, he uh, grays that out so that it is the final entry. So nobody will able to, to, to add additional information here. If somebody adds addition, then the chain of custody is going to be questionable. So that is how you, you transfer of chain of custody and uh, the chain of custody uh, 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 more information. And that's it uh, for, for, for now, because uh, I see the time is, is running out. And uh, uh, I think I'll go in, I'm going to open, uh, uh, put the mantle back to Eric uh, to moderate on any question that is, uh, you might be having. Thank you. Eric? Uh, thank you so much, Lawrence. Uh, uh, that was really long and uh, enriching. Thank you so much for that presentation. I think uh, uh, a lot of, lot of the comments that I've seen, people are commending the, the presentation that you've done. Uh, we want to confirm that uh, I think quite a number of people would want to see, go through the slides. We are going to ensure that uh, those can be provided. So Barbara, will you, can you, I don't know if you can take us through the question answer so that uh, we could probably pose a few of the questions that have been asked. And uh, anyone who probably feels like they have a question, they could uh, put up their hand and uh, then we can see if we could be able to enable them to ask uh, whatever questions they have. Barbara? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Dinga. As uh, Chairman has said, that was a very informative session. It's quite evident from the feedback we're getting from participants. There are a number of questions uh, that have been posed to you, Mr. Dinga. So what I'll do, I'll, I'll ask you about three so that you can answer them in phases to give the participants an opportunity to absorb what uh, you're saying. Uh, the first question is on the admissibility of digital evidence. You talked about legal authority and Mr. Eric Kinyua asks what is the test on legal authority? What if the evidence passes all other tests but the person presenting it had no authority to get the evidence? Will it still be admissible? And then uh, Mr. Joseph Manoba asks he would like to hear your thoughts on CCTV footage in public and private places vis-a-vis -vis the admissibility of evidence. On the issue of integrity, Mr. Muhire asks, how will you prove that the evidence has been interfered with? Has been interfered with. This is when you're the one opposed with the digital evidence. Mr. Dinga, maybe you could take those three questions to begin with. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about legal admissibility, 
uh, what we are talking about here is that uh, from the person who was who is uh, uh, doing the investigation, the, when they were going to the scene to do the investigation, did they have the legal authority to do that? Did they have the search warrant, or were they allowed to do that in that, that collection without a, a search warrant? Because there are certain circumstances whereby you do uh, a, a collection without a search warrant. But the, the, the legal uh, admissibility will, uh, the test will be from the person who is doing the investigation uh, uh, to the person who is going to present that in the court of law. Because if, if for example, you do investigation uh, 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 and then the, the, the other person goes and present that to in, the, in, in the court of law, you see, it still can be, can, can be refuted because you are not the person who did the investigation. You are not the person who know what the process that they, 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 they did to, to make sure that the, uh, the, the evidence was not interfered with. And that is why it is important that the person who is, who is doing that is, has been trained uh, is the is the uh, expert witness, and once you you've done that, you have to go and present that in the court of law. So the test will 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 commence from. Uh, I can say that the test is, is starts with the person who does the investigation to the person who will present that in the court of law. If there's there, there's a, a broken uh, uh, there's a broken chain there, then it becomes a problem. The, uh, for example, uh, the case in 2012 about Machage and others, uh, the person who, who did the, uh, the footage is not the, uh, is not the person who presented that in the court of law. And because of that, it was, it was, it was kicked out because the person who did the, 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 the footage uh, went to, to, I think it was Citizen TV, they aired it in the, in, in the evening, then the, the DCI guys came and picked that evidence and uh, took it to the court. It was it was it was thrown out because uh, it, they are not the people who actually did the the investigation. So uh, the, the the test uh, the legal as, uh, admissibility test must uh, commence at the, the from the person who did the investigation to the person who is going to present that in the court of law. Now, when it comes to uh, CCTV uh, footage, this is still a, a, an electronic evidence, uh, and uh, it is subjected to. The, the, the various uh, aspects of admissibility, uh, or, or starting with the collection, was it collected in, the, in, a, in, in, a, in a valid manner? Uh, was it authenticated? Was it, is it relevant? So uh, it does not matter whether it's a, a CCTV footage. What, it, what matters is when, when this, this uh, evidence is brought to the court of law, is it going to stand the test of the court? when it comes to authenticating that evidence. So it does not matter what, from which source, provided that it, is, it, is, it can be uh, authenticated uh, to, be, to, to have been collected, to have been pre presented in a proper and legal manner. The other issue of integrity is, um, we are going to look at this when, uh, when we, are, we are looking at the for forensic process. Now, what happens in integrity? Integrity is, is always, always means accuracy. And integrity also means that whoever is doing that is actually the person who is supposed to do that. Now, integrity also means that, yes, what I'm presenting is an exact replica of the other, the, the original evidence. So in forensics, what we do is uh, we call that acquiring of the data. When you're acquiring the, the data, you use methodical means of acquiring the data. And what, what comes clear uh, out there is what we call um, uh, the bit by bit copy of the original hard disk. That uh, sometimes you call it a disk imaging. The disk imaging is different from copying and pasting because when you copy and paste, then you see you've changed things like dates and all, uh, things like that. And secondly, you remember I, talk, I talked about deleted data, deleted space within the, 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 uh, the, the hard disk. So those deleted spaces, you also need them. So that is why you do what we call bit by bit copy of the original copy or disk imaging. Now, once you've done that, uh, the, 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 the process of doing the disk imaging creates what we call the hash values or the, 
the message digest. And then once you, you do the, you, you created the, 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 the copy, you compare the message digest or the, the hash value with the, the, the one which was cal calculated on the original disk. If they match, you know that that is an exact copy. So the integrity of that data is, uh, that, that evidence is maintained. I hope I'm clear. Yes, Mr. Dinga. Still a number question of questions coming in on the issue of admissibility. Uh, Ms. Jamila would like to know, when digital evidence in the form of a video recording involves more than one party, must all the parties involved give consent for the video recording to be termed as legally obtained for it to be admissible in court? Um, further to that, Mr. Kinyua asks, uh, for example, a phone recording, a phone recording conversation. Um, would a phone recording conversation be admissible as evidence in court? Uh, then there is, is there a way to collect evidence in a case of live streaming, specifically when it comes to child or online abuse bearing? in mind that nothing is recorded uh before th there's also one on you had mentioned that when we delete things from our computer we never really delete yeah, experts like you can still retrieve them uh with that regard joy asks then what happens when she shifts and types delete yeah le let me start with the with the, with the delete one now, delete, as I said, uh, does not in any way, whether you uh, press shift delete, whatever it is, does not delete data from the hard disk. Delete, what it does, it just, it just marks that place that where the file was occupying, uh, it marks it as a uh, deleted file, while it is not actually deleted. And that's why I, I say that when you bring another file, which is uh, uh, smaller than the, the original file, then it's going to occupy that space, but there's going to be residual data of the original file that was being replaced. So when you're doing your investigation, that, that residual data is very important for, for investigation because you can extract a lot of information. So uh, whether you press shift and delete, please know that uh, it is not possible to delete everything from the computer. When it talk, talks about when we talk about live streaming, uh, just the way I talked about uh, uh, live forensic, live forensics. You remember what I say that uh, live forensics is whereby you are collecting data while the thing is running. Now, live streaming is uh, is uh, like also what we call network forensics. What happens that you can be able to to capture the packets as they they. Uh, transfer uh, far from the one point to the other. And then you can be able to analyze those packets and find the data that you want. There, there's, there's, a, there's a, there are quite a number of, uh, uh, of uh, application that do, do that. And that we can, we can only cover uh, into detail when we are doing what we call the network forensics. So it is possible to, to, uh, to do, to what, to what? To co collect that data and uh, 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 have it uh, for properly authenticated uh, uh, and, and presented to court. But the, mo the most important, I, t I told you that, you see, it is not a matter of the, 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 the gadgets or the software or the, the hardware that you're using to, to do to co collect the data. What is also important at the same time is the procedures of uh, collecting that data, uh, the processes, and the way it is going to be presented in the court. You can have very good uh, hardware and whatever, but if you don't use the proper procedure to do that, then still that, that evidence is going to be uh, not admissible in the court of law. Uh, the, the, the issue of dig video evidence, yeah, the video evidence, I, I, I don't know how, <clears throat> when you say that uh, you have to get consent from ev uh, everybody, but see, if it is a criminal case, and uh, let's say the DCI comes in and, and, and uh, and has got the, the, the search warrant to do to collect that evidence. Then I don't think the consent is uh, for each and every person is needed because it can be proved that this this evidence it was it was used is going to be used uh, in the court of law and it has got some sort of uh, 
it is it is used on criminal case uh, uh, cases and 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 uh, you can it can be used in court so it is it is not necessary that you need to have the consent of everybody provided this these pe these people have got the search warrant to do that uh, it, it depend on what the court the court uh, what the search warrant says um, what el what el hada hmm I think yeah. you've, you've, you, you've captured just uh, the questions I'd presented to you. Mm. Um, there's a question from Sandra. She asked, is it possible to recover data from a device that was dumped in water in order to destroy evidence? Uh, further to that, with regard to, you talked about the types of, uh, of data, with regard to residual data, and you gave an example of an 80 page document what happens when a 100 page document is used to override the space resulting from the prior deleted document is the space entirely overridden uh, then there is with the cloud computing eliminating the physical element of quote unquote dead box how do you see digital evidence stored in the cloud and then there's also this question, is it possible to, sorry, uh, in what form should the prosecution serve the advocates for the accused person with audio recording? Can the audio recording be sent as an attachment in an email or even through WhatsApp? Is that possible? Okay. Now, when it comes to video recording, uh, uh, it, it is something that... Uh, I think many many people uh, think that it is is is, is easier, but it is not as easy as that. V, um, let's say audio recording or video recording. Uh, let's say audio recording. Now, if I bring that to court of law, and that is what the case that I had last last year. If I uh, and uh, the, the thing is that the prosecution brought the the evidence, and the evidence was audio versus video. Now. Uh, uh, Oh, the, the the video the, the audio had got the the, the voice of this uh, the, the accused and uh, the other person the other people so uh, it, it, what, how, after doing the investigation they transcribed uh, the, these voices uh, into a document and say that yes uh, this uh, this is the voice of this person now I refuted that because I asked them what is the scientific uh, um, uh, scientific backup that can show that what, whoever is talking on the video is actually the person you are referring to. So if there is no any scientific backing to, 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 to actually uh, back that particular uh, audio, it will be very difficult to be admissible. Because first of all, uh, you've seen now, uh, nowadays in, in, uh, in the internet where somebody speaks like Obama, uh, somebody purports to, be, to have uh, have uh, taken a picture with Obama. Now, how do you verify that the person who is talking on that video audio is the person you are, you are accusing? Now, without that scientific backup, it becomes difficult. So there must be a way of doing that scientifically. Now, when it comes to uh, data that is, uh, you've, uh, you've uh, put something on, on water. Let's say, for example, a mobile phone. Uh, forensics is a, a, a new discipline and it keeps on changing every day. Now, when you talk, talk about, uh, let's say, for example, a mobile phone and you think you put it on the data, still we can be able to pick that, uh, the, the, uh, the circuit, circuit and do what we call, uh, in forensic, we call it JTAG or chip off, um, chip off uh, analysis of that, that, that particular device, and we can still be able to recover the data. So it depends on what is it that you are, you've actually uh, put on the water, uh, that, uh, and it will determine what are the steps or what are the procedures of recovering, uh, covering that data. Now, when it comes to the detailed file, as I said, uh, you have a 500 page document, and you have, you, you have, uh, uh, yeah, you have a 20-page document that you've deleted. Then you bring 
uh, a, a, a 100 page document. They, of course, the 100 page is going to be bigger, bigger than the 20 page. So what happens is that it's going to, when you copy it the, on, on that particular uh, sector, or that particular space, it is going to actually be able to, to, to cover all that space and that residual data is not going to be available uh, anymore. But still, there are, uh, as I'm telling you, this, uh, this industry is actually uh, developing very fast. And uh, there are certain ways which I, can, I, I can't uh, talk about now, that even on that, you can still be able to recover some, some data. Yeah, Any, anything I did not attach? Uh, no, no, Mr. Lega, I think uh, you, you, you've answered uh, all the questions I've asked so far. So many questions coming in, Mr. Edinger. Um, yeah. How do you overcome the challenges with judges' inability to grasp technology as evidence? I guess this is in your day-to-day -day court attendance. And what are the implications of police liaison officers being involved in extraction of call data at the source, particularly with regard to integrity and credibility of the evidence vis-a-vis -vis its admissibility? Um, then Mr. Wanjoi asks, does admissibility go to the extent of right to privacy? For instance, evidence that might indulge into private life of a person or might be defamatory. Um, then Sandra asks, can the other party request for retrieval of necessary evidence for their own case without the chain of custody being broken? Over to you, Mr. Dinga. Mm. Now, the chain of custody, when it is broken, then it, it casts doubt on that evidence when you bring it to court. So whatever you are doing, whether it is private or, or uh, public, whatever you are doing must make sure that if that evidence is going to be brought to the court of law, then you have to convince the court that the chain of custody has not been broken. From the time the evidence was collected, to the time the evidence was preserved, to the time the evidence was presented in the court of law. If, uh, the, the, well, let me put it clear, if it is supposed to go to court of law, the chain of custody is important and must be maintained. Without, a, if you, the court can establish that you did not, the, cost of, the chain of custody is broken, then uh, admissibility of that evidence becomes difficult. So it is important uh, that the lawyer who is, uh, who is representing that person just make sure that yes, uh, we did this uh, privately, but yes, the, the, the chain of custody has not been broken. But if it is broken, I'm telling you, it's going to cast doubt on that, that particular evidence. The second thing is, is, is privacy and, and admissibility. The, the, uh, I, I can't remember that because but it, it was a case in the UK where these people were trying to to, to uh, discredit the evidence because they are bringing in the issue of privacy. I think this depends on, on the, the weight of the case itself and, and also um, uh, uh, what, what the investigation was doing. So if, uh, the, uh, if this, the, the person can, can, can bring the issue of, uh, of um, uh, privacy, then they have to show that the way that evidence was collected actually interfered with their privacy, but depends on the, the weight of the case itself. Um, now, oh, police and, and judges, there's a problem. And I I'm telling you that there's a big problem, but I think we are moving somewhere. Because like now, I think when you go to DCI, uh, we have the cyber de department. And the cyber department, we have very, very capable people who, who, are, who can do this. Uh, investigation. It is not just any any ordinary pol uh, police who is going to do the investigation, but there, there we have a cyber unit in the in the DCI who handle all this information. Uh, do do this investigation. Sometimes when they are overwhelmed, is maybe if for example there's a case which you, which I was doing, uh, but in that case they they could not the IO officer could not find anybody from the cyber. To do that, uh, to do that investigation, so they approached me to do that investigation from because th that case was actually in Meru, so they called me to do that investigation, N not because the the cyber unit could not do it, but because I think they were overwhelmed with, with cases that they had. But I can tell you right now, 
we have very, very capable uh, personnel in the, in the cyber unit in the investigation. Judges, I think a lot of things that we need to do is training, training and training, because yeah, some of the judges uh, do not understand this. This is a new thing, this is a new thing. We need to understand that. And that's, that's, uh, judges who are, who are 50 years old plus and, and, and have been doing their work very well. And so what we need to do is just, we are introducing some, a, a new concept, just a matter of making sure that we can train them uh, on this digital evidence and, 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 and cyber crime to know how they are going to, 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 to know how they can handle it. It's a lot of trends. When I, when I went to court uh, in, in Mawa in, in, uh, in 2016, uh, this is the first time I, I went to court with a projector. And when I went to the court with a projector and everybody, the court was full because they wanted to know what kind of evidence this guy is going to do to give that, pro, that they have to have the projector. And when I was giving my, uh, my, my testimony, what I was doing, I was much educating the court on uh, what to do because this, this was particularly on, the, on email authentication. So I had to, to explain to the court how email works in a simple language that they will be able to, uh, to understand and relate that to the real world on the, the, the snail mail. So if we, if you need, if we need to, to move forward, it's just to do a lot of training uh, to, uh, on this um, uh, for the judges. And that's why uh, I'm, I'm listed as a consultant in uh, judicial training on cybercrime and, li and, uh, and, and electronic evidence uh, and also law enforcement uh, training on uh, cybercrime and uh, uh, electronic evidence. A lot of things, a lot of training, a lot of noise, necessary noise must be made for, for us to succeed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dinga. I think we have, we still have about uh, 10 to 15 minutes. So you could take a few more questions before we wind up this session. Um, there's a question from Ella May and she asks, while admitting evidence in court, what guarantees a screenshot and a blue tick on WhatsApp to become admissible as evidence? Um, is it not possible inadmissible digital evidence can be the only reliable evidence. For example, pictures that court needs to, that court needs to preserve inadmissible evidence where all the criteria has not been met for the sake of justice or future discovery. And then Mr. Gatambia asks, uh, could you comment on the admissibility of viral clips normally shared on social media platforms and CCTV footages that depict the commission of a crime in view of the requirements of a certificate. Um, Mr. Kinyo would like more details of what you refer to as the Bomach Bomachage case. Any t do you have any citations for the case? He said it when you were speaking on a video on Citizen TV. And then Anne asks, are there guidelines on acceptable scientific backup that can be relied on to guide the court, say if both parties have forensic experts who have divergent views. Just the last question, just the last question is? Are there guidelines on acceptable scientific backup that can be relied on to guide the court, say if both parties have forensic experts who have divergent views? Are there any guidelines? Yeah, let me start with that one. One, guidelines are there. Uh, we looked at the I, IOCE. Now, when, wherever you are an expert, uh, we are both experts and we've come, come to court. Now, what we have to convince the court is that, yes, we have pro followed the pro proper procedures and standards of doing the investigation. And uh, so these guide, guidelines are there. Uh, you can look at... Uh, uh, the, the ACPO, which I showed you, the, the, the principles of, of digital evidence. So it, uh, you can use various methods or, or various hardware and software to do your investigation, but does it adhere to the guidelines that are internationally recognized? So you can look at the, the, the ACPO guideline, which I showed you uh, for principles. You can also look at the, 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 the software, the a scientific group of, on, on digital evidence, you can also look at the IOCE. 
those are those are, are going to give you uh, quite a number of uh, uh, quite a good information in terms of 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 the guidelines that you need to look at now um i think for the uh, uh, the machage case let me just see i think uh, let me, I, 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 ha I, I had it uh, uh, just a moment please just give me let me just find it uh, Oh, I, I cannot, I can't, ha I don't have it. Uh, I can't fi find it here, but it is there. I think you, what you do is uh, you go to uh, low review. I think uh, you'll be able to get that case. That case is there in 20, 2010. Uh, it, it, is, it is somewhere yeah, among the archives. Now, the other thing is uh, uh, the viral clips. Now, the same thing I'm, I'm talking about. See, we are, what are, what are the, some of the things that you need to look at when you're looking at the admissibility of digital evidence. Here is a case whereby this person as, a, as, a, as a, the, the, the digital is, is going viral, but who, where did it originate? Who, who, who originated that, in, that digital evidence? Because you cannot take it from any, any phone and present, present it to court. In, in, any, in WhatsApp, you can, you can always get the original author of that uh, digital evidence. Once you get the author of that digital evidence, then it has to pass through those procedures for admissibility of digital evidence, for it to be admit, admittable, uh, admittable in the, the court of law. Without passing those through, uh, through those procedures uh, and making sure that you can convince the court that the, 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 the evidence is original, then it will not be uh, uh, possible to be admitted. So it depends on, uh, as I said, the procedures and the processes uh, of presenting this evidence in the court of law in a way that it is going to be legally admissible. If it, there's, there, there, there's some cast of doubt on the digital evidence, it becomes difficult uh, for, for this to be, to be presented. So whether it is, it is a screenshot of, of, of um, uh, a screenshot of a, a computer, whether it is a, 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 viral, a viral video clip, provided it meets the admissibility criteria, then it is going to be admissible. If it does not meet, then it is not going to be admissible. And the court has got a way and the guidelines of making sure that the, uh, uh, those tests are done to, 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 to make sure that they meet. So it is you as if it's a, you are a defense lawyer and this has been presented to you, just make sure that yes, uh, do, do we test to find out that this particular evidence meets the criteria that is, uh, that is uh, required for it to be admissible. Yeah. Ms. Edinga, uh, there was a question on the admissibility of a phone recording conversation. I'm not sure if you captured that. Yeah, uh, phone conversation. It is uh, what I what I'm saying. It is still electronic evidence. What what you need to to make sure is that when you are presenting that in the in the in the court of law, you must maintain the originality of that phone uh, of that conversation. You must maintain that yes. This phone, I can establish that this conversation was coming from this phone, and this phone was a Nokia phone, serial number, blah, 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 and this is the date that the phone was, uh, the conversations took place, and I can be able to trace uh, uh, the, 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 the conversation. And this might, might in, in, involve maybe third party, maybe if it is Safaricom or whatever, but it provide, what, what is important is that, it, is that any electronic evidence is admissible provided that it meets the criteria for admissibility. Oh, oh, oh. And that is, you, you'll have to, to look at, like in our case, you have to look at the, the, the Evidence Act, and also you'll have to look at the, the principles of, of um, uh, that, gu that guide uh, admissibility of evidence, or, uh, or uh, the principle that, that, that guide the investigation of mobile or, or, or electronic evidence from various devices. Uh, Mr. Dingas, uh, we wind up. Uh, you could uh, take 
the last two questions. Uh, Nelson Ogeto, I see your hand is up. I'll ask the question and then you can switch on your mic to ask, uh, to ask Mr. Dinga the question you had. Um, Mr. Muhire asks, on, on the issue of chain of custody, um, does it mean that the one presenting the digital evidence has to be present with the document with the documentation on the same on the issue of chain of custody and then i think the question for michael muko you've tackled it print out of screenshots particularly whatsapp have become quite common as exhibits please take us through the areas of concern with such evidence uh and lastly mr ogeto over to you thank you barbara i've been waiting for this uh, particular session uh, anyway, I only had two questions to Mr. Dinga. Uh, the first one is, how do I guard myself or from any intrusion from any person who might want to wiretap into my phone conversations or track me through my particular phone? Eh? That is question number one. Uh, question number two, uh, sometime, there was two months ago, there was a robbery incident along Kilimani or Halingamere, if I remember well. Uh, the two alleged uh, robbers were captured on CCTV camera, but it wasn't clear as to their identity. So in this case, the police managed to digitally track them down and have them charged in court. So I wanted to find out from Mr. Dinga what particular form of digital evidence did they use to nail down these particular suspects? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Now, uh, let me start with that one of Hallingham, that robbery. I think it went viral. Uh, one thing that the, 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 the evidence which I think was brought to court is that uh, that viral video that was captured when these guys were actually robbing this person. I think everybody saw that. Now, when it, it is brought to court, still my, my, my concern, it is how it is brought to court and presented that will uh, uh, lead to the, uh, to, to, to the to these guys being uh, charged, but if they find uh, if the the prosecution the the, the, the prosecution or, or the defense uh, 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 attorney finds that they can poke holes on the way that evidence was collected and was presented, then still they can go uh, go scot free. Uh, so it depends on how. So I, I, I still insist on the procedures and processes of uh, of of doing the investigation and preserving that, uh, that, that evidence, uh, digital evidence, and bringing into court of law. Uh, that is very important. You will de determine whether that, that evidence is going to be admitted or that evidence is not going to be admitted in the court of law. Now, when it comes to, to guarding yourself uh, from tapping, now that question is difficult. Because why it is difficult? Because you do not control, actually, you are not the, the, the service provider. Uh, I, I think that uh, your, your service provider, uh, whether Safari or Morton, they can, when this, you are being uh, followed or whatever, you have something, then the, I think the government has got the authority to attack you. The only, the only way that there are other technologies, which I don't think it is good to discuss it here, but there are other technologies which uh, uh, you, can, you can have in, put in place if you are a group of people and you want you want evade the the normal uh, the, the normal uh, GPRS phone, what you do you can have what we call the uh, the secure phones using what we call uh, the voice over IP on on the internet, so that uh, um, when you 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 are when you want to communicate with the other party, then they have to have the 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 the, the, the type of phone and the the, the app that is going to conceal your identity. Just like what we ha have right now, what we call the, uh, um, uh, the dark web or the tour, the, 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 the onion router, whereby you find that people do a lot of uh, uh, trade, illicit trade on the internet, on the dark web using tour because you cannot be, be tracked. But however, even in the tour, uh, if I can remember in 2013, the, the, the biggest guy in, in, in to, uh, uh, who had got the, the biggest uh, site that was selling uh, drugs, that, that is a Silk Road, the guy was still uh, nabbed in uh, San Francisco. So when, uh, how, how was it now? Because 
the, the the FBI had got also their tour servers on the on the network. So when it comes to 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 guarding yourself, I think uh, it's not it's a difficult question to answer. Yeah, I, I don't think I, I can give you. A, this is how you can do it. But yes, there are ways you can do it uh, to to guard guard yourself by using secure phone. One of the, the one of them I have here is called uh, uh, crypto crypto uh, crypto phone. Now, crypto phone. What happens that that if I want if I want to communicate with somebody uh, secretly, then the, the person must have the app, the app. So when when I call him, I don't. It, there's no trace which is uh, left on on the phone or on the network because he's using the internet to connect to the other party. But I mean, it is a difficult question, surely. Now, when it comes to chain of custody, yeah, a chain of custody is, as I said, is important. Chain of custody is important in any case. Any case that you are going to to bring to court, what they are going to dwell in is first of all how was when remember it starts when the the the, the, uh, the evidence is recovered and it goes until the evidence is been uh, the case is over and the evidence can either be released to the uh, to, to the owner or it can be uh, taken into custody so that is when the chain of custody from the the, the time it uh, the evidence is acquired to the time it is disposed so if there's the, the court can be convinced, and this is what I tell you as a, as a lawyer, this is something that you can, you can really capture on. You can uh, actually capture uh, uh, stress on this to make sure that you till the, 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 the case uh, uh, in your favor. Because I can, uh, as I told you last year when I was, I was doing this investigation, I found out that yes, uh, the, the, the the prosecution had done the report. Uh, they had uh, they had uh, brought the uh, the CD. However, I asked them where is the the device that was used to co co to capture this video. They told me the court told me that this this device was taken again by the investigator. Then I said now that that means that the the chain of custody has been broken and we cannot trust this evidence because. What we need to do is if you can get us that, that mobile-like device, then we can use it to see if we can mimic that environment and come up with the, with the, same, uh, the, the, the same type of evidence. If that is not there, then it means that we cast doubt on the, on the, on the, on, on the evidence. So it is important for a lawyer, make sure that you insist on the chain of custody. Make sure that you know from the time the evidence was collected to the time the evidence was was uh, was brought to court. Was there a break in the chain of custody? And if there is a break in the chain of custody, then you have a, a leeway to to to, dis, to refute that that uh, particular uh, evidence. Back to you, Barbara. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dinga. I I hope I've captured all the questions that were posed. If I haven't. I'll be sure to mark and ask Mr. Dinga in our next session. Mr. Dinga, thank you so, so much. A lot of feedback coming in from the participants. This was a very informative session. They say the presentations were wonderful. Most of the participants have sat in from when we started up to now. Um, there is, if you'll allow me to read some of the comments. Dr. Owenga says that was just great, Lawrence. Uh, there are participants who are also asking for your contacts. I believe um, the same in the slides, and we'll share the slides. But I'll give you an opportunity to make uh, a parting shot. Um, uh, Ivan says you've done a good job. Basically, I think all the participants are very very impressed with the presentation uh mr dinga at this point if you'd like to make any parting closing remarks before i close the session yeah um, <clears throat> just as i said uh, digital forensics uh, and and, and uh, cyber crime investigation is a new new uh, field mm -hmm. and uh, uh, if you look at digital forensics it was just admitted as a forensic science i think uh, some four times back in the uh, in 20, two, two, 2003, 
So it is a new, a new, a new, a, a new discipline. What we need to do as lawyers is to work together with technical people like us so that we can help you uh, in your cases. Uh, what I can tell you, the cases that I have, have, have handled, I think uh, I've, I've, been, uh, I've been able to help uh, the lawyers I'm working with to win the cases because what I do is that I just make sure, I just look at, uh, if it is a, a report that has been done, I just look at the report that, uh, that has been done and try to compare that against the standards and the principles in digital forensics and see where uh, where uh, that investigator went wrong. So uh, I, I still welcome anybody who has got any 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 <clears throat> investigation regarding cyber uh, cyber security and digital forensics. Just you can contact me. I gave, I uh, gave you my number. And I think all EL, EL, ELS is also going to share my number. So you can always contact me if you have any case uh, involving digital forensics and, and, and investigation. I'll be very much willing to help. Otherwise, I thank you so much for uh, attending this session. I can see there are still people hooked, uh, which means that may, uh, the, the session was good and uh, it is uh, a lot of information that we can get out of this. So let's continue learning uh, uh, because this is a new display. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Dinga. Uh, thank you to all our amazing participants. Thank you for sitting through the entire two hours. Um, most of you have asked about the presentation. Uh, we'll share the same the email used to register. The link will send you the link. We'll also send you the the slides. I will send you the link to the recording and the slides as well. Uh, this is as we had said as David had said. This is a three part uh, training. So we've just we've covered the first part on digital evidence. Part two will be next week on Thursday, same time on the thirteenth of August, from three to five p.m. Uh, and Mr. Dinga will tackle digital forensic process. Uh, he'll discuss the digital forensic process, common digital forensic practices, standards for digital forensic and digital evidence, as well as good practices in digital forensics. So I look forward to seeing all of you. Please uh, share the link with your colleagues and friends so that we can have uh, more numbers next time. A good evening to all of you. Thank you, David, from the Secretariat. Thank you, Mr. Dinga, once again. And we look forward to hosting you again next week on Thursday, same time. May you all have a good evening.